Hey everyone, and welcome. Today, we're gonna talk about something that's a total game changer when you're looking at health data, the confidence interval. Seriously, instead of just grabbing one single number and hoping it's right, confidence intervals give us this incredible range that shows us the bigger picture. And when you're making huge decisions in public health, seeing that bigger picture is absolutely everything. Okay, let's just dive right in with a real world scenario. Picture this, you're working for the health authority in Ghana. You've got a massive job, figure out the true rate of high blood pressure in a huge community. And this isn't just some textbook problem, right? This is about deciding where to put money, how many clinics you need, what kind of supplies to order. You can't test every single person, so what do you do? This is where stats become a lifesaver. Well, the first thing you'd probably do is take a sample. It just makes sense. You'd go out, find a random group of, I don't know, 100 people, check their blood pressure, and then calculate the average. That single number you get, that's what we call a point estimate. It's basically your best single guess for what's happening in the entire community. So you run the numbers and bam, your sample gives you an average of 130 millimeters mercury. Simple enough. Looks like you have your answer. You could just report back and say, hey, the average is 130. Problem solved? Well, not so fast. Is that really the whole story? Because here's where it gets tricky. What if another team does the exact same thing, just with a different random sample of people? They get 135 millimeters mercury. And a third team, they get 128. This is just the nature of sampling. It's called sampling variability. Every time you dip into the population, you're gonna get a slightly different result. So which one is right? 130, 135, 128? A single point estimate just can't answer that question. So clearly we need a better tool. Think of it like this. A point estimate is like trying to hit a target by throwing a single spear. You might get lucky and hit the bullseye, but chances are you'll be a little bit off. A confidence interval, though, that's like casting a wide net. You're not trying to pinpoint the exact location. You're trying to capture the truth somewhere within a reasonable area. It's a totally different mindset. It's about embracing uncertainty instead of pretending it doesn't exist. So what a confidence interval really is, is a range of values where we're pretty sure the true answer for the whole population is hiding. It's just a more honest way of doing things because it admits, hey, we're working with a sample, so there's some uncertainty here, and it actually tells you how much. For our team in Ghana, it's the huge difference between saying the average is 130 and saying we're pretty confident the real average is somewhere between this number and that number. So how do we actually build this net? Well, every single confidence interval has three main parts. First, you've got your point estimate. That's your 130, the starting point right in the middle. Then there's something called the margin of error. That's what tells you how wide to cast your net. And finally, you've got the confidence level, which is basically how sure you wanna be that your whole method worked. That's it. Now, in health sciences, you are going to see 95% all the time. It's the gold standard. But what does 95% confident actually mean? It's a little tricky. It means that if we were to do this whole sampling thing, say a hundred times, the method we're using to create our net would successfully catch the true population average in 95 of those hundred attempts. So our confidence isn't in this one specific result. Our confidence is in the process itself. Okay, time to get into the nitty gritty. Let's see how this actually works when we're dealing with a measurement like blood pressure. We're gonna build the formula for our team in Ghana right now. It's a pretty straightforward four-step process. First, you calculate your sample mean and also the standard deviation, which just tells you how spread out your data is. Second, you pick your confidence level. Let's stick with 95% and find something called a critical value. We often get this from a t-distribution, which is perfect for health studies where you might have smaller samples. It basically gives you a little extra wiggle room for that uncertainty. Third, you put those pieces together to calculate the margin of error. And finally, the easy part, you just add and subtract that margin of error from your sample mean. That's your range. And this is where the magic happens. We start with our point estimate, 130. Let's say after our calculations, we find the margin of error is three millimeters of mercury. So we just do the math. 130 minus three gives us 127. And 130 plus three is 133. And boom, there it is. Our 95% confidence interval is from 127 to 133 millimeters of mercury. We've officially gone from one shaky number to a solid, useful range. Okay, that's great for averages, but what if your data is more of a yes or no thing? Like what percentage or proportion of a community has malaria? Well, guess what? Confidence intervals are amazing for that too. 
And you know what? The process is going to look super familiar. Step one, you calculate your sample proportion. So let's say 20% of kids in your sample have malaria. Then you pick your confidence level, find a critical value, this time usually from a Z distribution, which works great for this kind of data. After that, you calculate your margin of error and, you guessed it, build your interval. It's the same exact logic, your best guess, plus or minus a little wiggle room. So when it's time to report back, how do you actually say this? This part is so important. For our Ghana example, the proper, official way to say it is, we are 95% confident that the true mean systolic blood pressure for the entire community is between 127 millimeters mercury and 133 millimeters mercury. That sentence is packed with useful, honest information. Now, it's just as crucial to know what this doesn't mean. Let's clear up a couple of common traps. First, it is not correct to say there's a 95% chance the true average is in our range of 127 to 133. Once we have that range, the true average is either in it or it isn't. The 95% refers to our confidence in the method we used. And second, this range is about the population average. It absolutely does not mean that 95% of people in the community have blood pressure in that range. So what this really all boils down to is a shift from pretending we have certainty to expressing our confidence. We're moving away from the false precision of one single number to a range that's way more honest and, frankly, way more useful. That's just good science. And here's something you can use right away. The width of the interval tells its own story. If you get a really wide interval, like, say, 110 to 150 millimeters Hg, that's a sign of a lot of uncertainty. It's kind of like a blurry photo. But a narrow interval, like our 127 to 133, that's a sharp, high-definition picture. It gives you a lot more precision and lets you make decisions with, well, more confidence. Which brings us right back to where we started, but now we're in a much better place. That health authority in Ghana doesn't just have a single guess anymore. They have a reliable range from 127 to 133. And that entire range signals that there's a problem with elevated blood pressure in the community. So the question isn't, what's the number anymore? The question is, what are we gonna do about it? So I'll leave you with this. Armed with that data, what's the very first decision you would make? That's how we turn statistics into action.